So listen, have you ever been pushed to your limit? Like, like, have you have you ever reached a place in your life where you just said, "Look, I have, I've had enough. I've had enough." Like, like may, maybe you've been through something as painful as a divorce, or, or, or maybe you had to make a career change at some point, and you're just like, "I'm not doing that job anymore." But whatever it is, whatever it was, right? You had to draw a line, for better or for worse, to say, "I'm not doing that anymore." Well, listen, we've been talking about uh, David's story and how Saul was pursuing him for so long. Well, listen, at some point, David reached his limit. At some point, he'd had enough. He'd been on the run for Saul for so long, he decided to take drastic action to make a change. And if we look closely at what unfolded, we'll see a sign of growth and find an incredible opportunity for us all to grow from religion to relationship. That's where we're going today. Let me pray and then we'll dive right in. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to dive into your word. But most importantly, God, I thank you for an opportunity for your word to dive into us. Well, if that's what our expectation is, that you would speak, we would hear, and that we would be changed. Thank you for that, Lord. Be with us in our time, Lord. Be glorified in us as we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you have Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel um, chapter 27. I'm I'm just going to pick up reading there and let's look at what's going on with David here. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1, it says this, But David thought to himself, One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. I'll pause right there because that is, that's an extraordinary conclusion that David is making here. He says, he says, because of what I'm experiencing, because my life is in danger, because because I've been made to feel so unwanted by the people of God, I'm better off going to live with the enemies of God. So, so, so David goes to live with the Philistines, like of all people, the Philistines. Like these are the same people that Israel has been fighting against all this time. Like this is, these are the same people that David killed their giant, Goliath. These are the same people that for his entire life, All he's ever heard, all he's ever known is that everybody believed that they should stay away from the Philistines. Now, now, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. If if David makes such a, a change in perspective in this, this is what I want you to pay attention to. There is deep concern amongst the people of God whenever someone begins to believe that they have to leave their faith in order to find God's peace. Like there's deep concern if someone decides they have to leave their faith to find God's peace. That means that something has gone terribly wrong amongst the people of God. And whenever we see that, typically the way we look at it, we jump to the conclusion that what is wrong is that person. We put all the weight, we put all the blame on that person. And honestly, this is a lot of what we see happening so much today because more and more people are making a decision to leave church or or, or maybe it's just to leave the traditional framework of religion and Christianity and church. Listen, they're tired and they've had enough. They are tired of, of like David, dodging spears, Right. They're tired of of feeling unwelcome and unwanted. They're tired of being alienated by people who are supposed to accept them. And listen, of course, they struggle with sin. Of course they do. Of course they have a need. Of course they are in an unfortunate place in life. This is the reason they came to Jesus in the first place. And in so many cases, it seems that the only people who are unaware of their need for God are the ones who are pointing at theirs. This is a problem. It's an issue. And I'm concerned, I'm concerned that in terms of gospel work, I'm concerned that the people of God have misunderstood the assignment. 
like they've completely confused what's right. Listen, the church has misunderstood the assignment whenever we find ourselves pointing at people rather than pointing to Jesus. It means we're fumbling. It means that we're defaulting on the mission. And what we see in David's story is actually perspective on the other side because his response, it demonstrates what it's like to be on the other side of that pointing. Right. Sometimes we can we can feel justified and, and, and we point at what we see somebody doing wrong or how they live or whatever the case may be. And we feel justified. But we need some understanding of what it's like to be on the other side of that pointing. And there's a lot for us to learn from David in this season of his life. Let's look at verse two. It says this. It says, so David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, son of Maok, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, the widow of Nabal. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. I'll pause right there because I want you to pay attention. Uh, David left the land of the people of God to go and make his home in the land of the enemies of God. That's a huge shift. That, that, that's a huge turnaround. Now, now, here's the deal. Before you judge him, you better understand why. You, you better ask, like, like, why in the world would he go and live with them? Why would he go live with those people out of all the options, out of all the, like, why would he go and live with them? Because here's the deal. In David's eyes, being with the real enemy of God was safer than being with the fake friend of God. Listen, the Philistines didn't know God, but they didn't claim to know him either. Do you, do you see that? Listen, a religion about God is never a safe place for those who are searching for an authentic relationship with God. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be safe. And the Philistines at this point, they were demonstrating more integrity than Saul, which means that David could trust them to be exactly who they presented themselves to be. Listen, let me let me jump to New Testament because, you know, Jesus had a lot to say about hypocrites. He had an awful lot to say about people who would say one thing and then do another. He had a lot to say about those whose behavior did not line up with their beliefs. For those who would talk about love, they would talk about it until it's time to actually do it. Jesus had a lot to say about those people. But I want you to pay attention to how these Philistines responded to David. Verse five, this says, then David said to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag, and it has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. David lived in Philistine territory a year and four months. I'll pause right there. Listen, the Philistine king did for David what King Saul should have done for him, and that's to make room. That, that's to make room. I'm telling you, the world is warmly welcoming and receiving the very people that the church has been steadily rejecting. The, the world is receiving them. The world is embracing them. And that's backwards. That is, that's backwards. And listen, I, I don't have all the answers on this, but I'm concerned that the church is defaulting on her mission. We want God to save whoever we are willing to receive instead of preparing ourselves to receive whoever God wants to save. That's what's broken. That, that's what's backwards. We seem to have our application of God's redemption confused. Listen, not when it comes to our sin, but certainly when it comes to the struggles of others. Now, here's the deal, because let me just give you clarity about this Philistine king. Listen, he had an agenda. Like, by no means was he godly. 
But David didn't embrace the Philistine king because he was godly. He embraced him because he was welcomed. Simple as that. Now, I'll pause right there because is it possible that someone who doesn't know the love of God could be more welcoming than you? You, you got to measure yourself. You, you got to pause long enough to consider what people experience with you, what, what they experience from your attitude, what they're what they experience from your perspective. You, you, gotta, you gotta pay attention to that. Listen, of course this Philistine king had an agenda. See, he hoped to have an alliance with David so that David would attack Israel for him. Th th that's what he was hoping for. That's why the land that he gave them was Ziklag because it was strategic. It, it was just close enough to Israelite territory to be a threat to them. But I want you to pay attention to what David does instead. Verse eight, it says this. Now, David and his men went up and raided the, the Geshurites, the Gerzites and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people had lived in the land extending to Shur in Egypt. When David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys and camels and clothes. Then he returned to Achish. When Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of, of Jeremiah, or against the Negev of, of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought. They might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. I'll, I'll pause right there because listen, David lied. <laughs> he, he lied to the Philistine king. He told him that he was attacking the people of God when in reality he was attacking other enemies. I need you to pay attention. This is, this is a big deal. Because understand, David is still working for God. He's still trying to do the God's business behind enemy lines, behind enemy lines. David is loving God from his personal relationship because he's not being allowed to love God from a religious context. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. And because he's not allowed to love God from a religious context, it looks like he's made himself comfortable with God's enemies. Listen, you better be careful about who you judge and about how you judge. No one has to conform to your preferred model of religion in order to have a personal relationship with the Lord. No one has to. Don't forget here, David was chosen king. All while this was happening, he's still king in the eyes of God. And now he can't even find community amongst the people that he's called to lead. In fact, God was literally saving David from the people by placing him in the hands of the enemies. Listen, I need you to think about that too. Do you think God ever has to save people from the church? <laughs> we, we think in terms of God saving people for the church. But do you think he ever has to save people from the church? You know, God's, we don't always do what we're supposed to do. We, we, we don't always say things the right way. We, we're not always merciful and loving and gracious and, and good. We, we, we're not always what we are supposed to be. So do you think that God, does he, does he ever have to save people from the church? I don't know about you, but as a believer, that gives me a lot to think about. As a pastor, that gives me even more to think about. Like this, this safe space. This, the safe space that we call our church family, like the very nature of it, the way we act, the way we talk, the way we think, the way we relate to each other. Is it a threat to anyone at all that the Lord wants to save? And if so, what do we need to do to change? Perhaps a better question is what do I need to do? to be changed. Listen, 
I love the church of Jesus Christ with all of my heart, all of my, I do. But I also know that religion can be hurtful. Like this, this call to receive others in truth and in love can be misunderstood as rejection of some people. And if you've ever been in David's shoes, listen, if you've ever been so hurt and so rejected by the people of God and so, so much so that you felt the need to leave and find a place in the world that was safe. Listen to me, I want to take a moment and ask you for forgiveness on behalf of the people of God, on, on, on behalf of the church, on behalf of Jesus Christ. I, I wanna repent to you for our lack of love and admit that our hands don't always reflect his heart. That's the truth. That is the truth. We need the Lord just as much as anyone else, maybe even more. So listen, if you would allow me, I want to encourage you. I want to remind you that wherever the church may have failed you, I want you to know that Jesus Christ has not. He, he has not rejected you. He has not pointed his finger at you. He has not withheld his love. He has not forsaken you or turned his back at all. That was us, not him, not him. And if you could find it in your heart to trust him, then I would invite you to a very special table that he's prepared for all who need him. Jesus is with his disciples and he's explaining the point of redemption to them. He says, listen, you guys are, are broken, you're messy, you don't obey, you don't do the right thing, you, you, you drift away from truth, that's, that is, that's all of you. But he says, I love you still. I love you anyway. And because I love you, I'm going to step in and take the punishment for all that's wrong with you, for all of, of your sin. And he takes the bread and he says, this bread represents my body that has been broken for you. If you believe that. Take the bread and eat. Likewise, he takes the cup. He says, this cup represents my blood. It represents my blood that's been poured out for you. That's been, that's been shed for you to cover your sin. The, the, the very reason that people might point the finger the very reason that people might reject you or turn their backs on you, listen, my blood has been shed to cover that sin. If you believe that, take the cup and drink. And he says, as often as you do this, as often as you come to this table, to receive my love, <laughs> to receive my, my redemption and my cleansing, then you receive the faith that you need to share my love with others. There are other people who felt rejected. There are other people who've been hurt and they need to know that I gave my life for them too. Will you join me? The Lord says, will you join me in my work? of saving everybody, everybody, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, no matter the past, no matter the current situation, will you join me in my work of saving everybody? <laughs> you, you say yes to that. I wanna pray for you. God, thank you so much 
Thank you, God, for choosing us. And I thank you, God, that you choose us on your terms, nobody else's. Nobody else's, dear God. And so we say yes to you simply because you said yes to us. And you take us. And you love us. And you change us, dear God, and you make us yours. And then you use us for your glory. We say yes to you, sir. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what their opinion might be, dear God. We belong to you. Fill us with your spirit and we will glorify you with our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.